Interesting, 1976-77, a time when the concept of intraocular lenses was going through a very bad phase. I would say that it would be accurate to say that 98 to maybe 99% of all ophthalmologists worldwide were condemning in the intraocular lens. Poor old Harold Ridley had been sent to Coventry for 40 years, never recognized for his incredible contribution to ophthalmology and you were a pariah because people would say to you, you put those things in human eyes? Well, my mentor and great friend David Miller, I was spending some time with him in Boston and he felt that the time was right for him to try an intraocular lens and I assisted him. And the next day the cornea looked like a, a white table napkin and I freaked out. My first inkling or reaction was to get the hell out of there before the lawyers came along. Anyhow, we treated this patient judiciously with steroids and over a period of two weeks the cornea cleared. And the reason for that was that the intraocular lenses would rip off the endothelium of the, co of the cornea because of electrostatic charges. And gradually, over the next two weeks, as this patient's cornea cleared, we became a little bit more brave, as it were, and said, well, how could we prevent this from happening? And I suggested that we take some very thick syrupy substance, put into the anterior chamber, which would then not leave the chamber, and you could then sort of like scuba dive inside there. And I had done this in other uh, non-medical non applications of fine modeling. And he said, well, like what? And I said, oh, I don't know. I would think of corn syrup type. And I said, that wouldn't work because the osmosis would destroy the endothelium anyhow. And he said, wait, wait, some years ago, a professor Balage had been recruited at Harvard to create an artificial vitreous, which is hyaluronic acid or sodium hyaluronate. And so, his contribution that particular afternoon was, this is what we should use. And I had come up with the viscous substance. And to cut a longer story short, I went up to New York to see Professor Balaj, uh, who wasn't very... At that stage, he had left Boston and um, was concentrating more his energies on other... At, you know. Uh, and wasn't too keen on sodium hyaluronate and ophthalmology anymore. Well, that's what I, he led me to believe. Anyhow, I prevailed on him and managed to get a couple of ampules, go back, and we started some work with rabbits. And the results were phenomenal. And then the next step over the period of, I mean, I did rabbit experimentation with corneal grafting, with intraocular lens implantations, all these potential applications, when? 1977. And I was going backwards and forwards from South Africa to Boston and when... At Harvard? Yeah, at Harvard, yes. And in, uh, in Boston at the ben Beth Israel, which was one of the Harvard teaching hospitals. David was my mentor and friend. And uh, the time came now to, obviously, is this going to work in humans? So I went back to South Africa. I went to the Medicines Control Council, which is their equivalent of the FDA. And they said, uh, give, me all, give them all the data gave me the permission to, after six weeks, they said you have permission to do 20 patients and then report back to us. And we'll, if everything goes fine, you can do the next 20. So that's how it started. So between July and October of 1978, the clinical trials were done under conditions that were probably the tightest that the FDA had ever seen because their monitors came down. Each patient was selected by one surgeon, that was me, operated by one surgeon, and every single post-operative uh, visit, day 1, 3, 5, 7, 14, 28, was done by me uh, without any, uh, any uh, assistance, as it were, and they spent eight weeks in hospital, which the patients loved. It was, for them, like a holiday, having the nurse, pretty nurses serving them three meals a day, and uh, it cost them, each patient, the equivalent of $5. Funny, isn't it? $5. <laughs> well, after that was finished, we read the first paper. And 
didn't get a good reception at all. I mean, I was remember people saying, are you crazy? You should be incarcerated in a mental institution. You take rooster juice from rooster combs, you grind it up and put it in human eyes. Are you crazy? So it, there was a lag phase of pretty much a year until the Europeans in March or April of 1979, I read a paper in Cannes in France, and the Europeans were completely different in their appraisal or seeing you know, what this was useful. Well, after that, it just took off. And to this day now, they say more than 300 million people have benefited from these, this molecule, which they now call rather hyaluronans than hyaluronic acid. So it's hyaluronan, a family of the molecules. And it's been used in many other applications as well, not least of all ladies' fillers, intra-articular joint, etc., etc. But from about 1982-83, I then, or even earlier, had gone on to using it in trauma, using it in pediatric cataracts, uh, using it in penetrating keratoplasties. In other words, finding every single possible use where this remarkable molecule could make surgical prognoses better and more predictable. What companies or company did you work with with the development of Helon as a... Oh, that was a Swedish company called Pharmacia, a small company. Subsequently became very, very big. And then Grease Harbor, uh, the famous Swiss company. I mean, small but highly motivated, making without doubt the finest uh, surgical instruments in the world and five generations, that romantic Swiss idea, almost like Swiss watchmakers. Uh, one of the most gen generous uh, per capita people that I've ever worked with. He gave unbelievably generously to to development of surgery in parallel with this molecule by making better instruments for the surgeon to be able to cut micro, micro uh, accurate uh, uh, interventions in ophthalmology. This is your friend, Hans Gries? Hans Griesaber, yeah, one of the, the great, great gentlemen and uh, benefactors of ophthalmology, absolutely. And then his son? His came? son, yeah, well, his son came down to me some years later and uh, I had the pleasure of training him uh, in... Maybe? His name is Matthias Griesaber, and uh, today he has become a very fine ophthalmic surgeon, and that's given me a great deal of pleasure. Some way I could have paid Hans back for all his generosity. So it's been a wonderful journey, really.